Good morning, and thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. Um, that's quite a long title, but hopefully by the end of my presentation, you'll understand a little bit more about it. This work that I'm talking about is part of a four-year National Institute for Health Research Fellowship. So four years' work in 15 minutes is going to be a little bit challenging, but I'll do what I can. So I'm not going to go over too much about atopic eczema because obviously you already know all about that, but it is important to say that in the UK, about 97% of people with atopic eczema are treated in primary care, so they never get to see people like you. And we know that consultation experiences can be poor for patients, parents, and for the practitioners themselves. And we obviously know that eczema can have a very high self-management demand. So knowledge mobilization, which is what my work is all about, um, there's lots and lots of theory around it, but in essence, it's moving knowledge to where it's most useful. And we know a lot about eczema, but we don't necessarily get those messages out to people who are trying to care for the, the condition themselves or to people like GPs and community pharmacists who are managing people out there. Mind lines, an interesting idea derived from Japanese work and then taken forward by colleagues Gabe and LeMay in the UK. And essentially, mind lines um, are these collectively reinforced internalized tacit guidelines. So what happens when we decide how we're going to treat people is we don't just look at things like the NICE guidance. We have lots of other sources of knowledge that we put together in our heads that drive our, our, our treatment decisions. So we like to think we follow guidelines, but in reality we don't. And when you think about what you've learned over time in practice, that all comes together in your head and changes what you do in practice. So I was interested in how eczema-specific mind lines are put together. And to find out a bit more, I was lucky enough to be able to go out into quite a poor area in the Midlands of the UK and actually watch what happened in practice. So for six months, I spent my time in GP practices actually looking at consultations and seeing what went on. And I sat through lots and lots of non-eczema consultations, but also eczema ones as well. Um, and you could see why people became a bit disillusioned on both sides. So from this work, so I observed, I talked to people, I did interviews, I had lots of informal com conversations. And from these, I developed mind lines, two, two types, lay eczema mind lines and also practitioner ones. Um, I haven't got time to go through all that illustration, unfortunately, but lay eczema mind lines um, were influenced by many things. Um, so people would listen to what the doctor or nurse said to them, but then they'd go away and talk to other people. So they would maybe talk to their family, their friends, people they meet, the community pharmacist, and messages that might have gone quite well from a general practitioner to a patient got quite messed up and changed along the way. Eczema was often actually treated by patients as a relatively low priority condition. And if you think about it, these are people for which eczema might be the second or third problem in a consultation. So it's not like people coming to you as specialists and eczema is their thing. These are people who have got lots of other issues. Um, and there was a whole group of people who I called self-managing by default. So they're people who have really, their eczema isn't severe enough to be referred to the hospital. 
um, but they're disillusioned with the care they're getting um, from GPs, and effectively they've, they've just walked away from treatment. So they've got bad skin, but they're not really doing very much about it. And that, uh, that's children as well as adults. Practitioner eczema mind lines. Again, I haven't got time to go through the whole um, illustration with you, but again, it was considered a low priority condition. There are no incentives in the UK for treating it. So there's no, no money attached to treating it well. And there was a great belief that the recipe doesn't change. And in, in some ways that resonates with what you were saying, Noreen. You know, if we, the recipe is the same um, for, for the less severe disease, so emollients, topical corticosteroids, but the subtleties of getting that right and the need for consistent treatment just doesn't come across. So they kind of knew the basics, but not how to convey that to, to patients and parents so they could actually um, treat the condition well. And that's, that's just the joining of lay and eczema mind lines because inevitably they come together. So my task was to think how we could change the way that uh, mind lines are formed and how we can change the way that people think. And that's quite a big ask. So what I did was get together a group of 25 people Parents of children with eczema, children with eczema, community pharmacists, general practitioners, practice nurses, dermatology specialist nurses. So 25 of us together for three separate days. And we looked particularly at what makes a good eczema consultation. And it was very interesting hearing it from both sides. So what do patients want? What do practitioners want? And what do people actually need to know to allow them to self-manage effectively? And the, the conversations were fantastic. We did all sorts of different activities to really try and understand what we're trying to do in terms of changing mind lines. And as you can imagine, there was an enormous amount of data coming out from these, these talks. But the key things were that we needed simple and consistent messages. We needed to work across boundaries, because I, as I said earlier, if you imagine somebody going to their GP and the GP says, yes, you, you do need to use a topical corticosteroid because you've got a flare at the moment, the person then takes the prescription to the pharmacy, the pharmacist says, oh, you've got to be ever so careful with steroids, only apply a tiny little bit. Then they meet a friend or another parent who says steroids, work of the devil. You know, the treatment isn't going to be good. They're not going to follow what they've been advised to do. So whatever messages they are need to go across the community and they need to be easy to access because the sort of people that I'm talking about are the people who have walked away from care so they're not the sort of people who are going to turn up and see experts like yourselves. So I started doing some work to, to change thinking. And the co-creation group, the 25 people who met for three days, came up with five key messages. Now, these aren't going to be any surprise to any of you. Um, and I have to say, these are just the core messages. And I'm getting them out there, but there's a lot, lot more detail behind them. Okay, so these are just five simple messages. So eczema is more than dr just dry skin. The number of patients who are told, oh, it's just a bit of dry skin, nothing to worry about. It doesn't just go away, it needs some care. You need to keep using the moisturizers. So many patients thought that you could just use them when the eczema was bad and then stop. This is sounding familiar to you, I guess. Steroid creams are okay when you need them. 
and you know your child's eczema best. So very, very simple messages. But then, how do you actually get them out there? So, as I said, my lines are derived from Japanese work, and, and I went back to have a look at some more Japanese work. It was very appealing. And they have a concept called bar, which is a space where knowledge is generated and shared. But bar isn't about the, the space itself. It's about relationships and sharing of knowledge. And so I set about setting up a virtual bar in a very um, bounded area. So we have um, postcode areas, and I, I was working in a, a very small, really quite deprived area in the Midlands of England. And I wanted to get out these five consistent messages in as many ways um, as I could. And these are some of the things that I've done. So I have worked with three GP practices which serve 30,000 people in this one very densely populated little area. So that's covered at virtually all the GPs. I've worked with community pharmacies and they tend to be attached to GP surg surgeries. They're independent, but they're close by. I've been in supermarkets. I've been in primary schools, in places of worship, at a city farm. I've been on local radio, just saying the same thing over and over again in the hope that people pick up these messages. Um, did some teaching um, with health visitors, who are obviously quite influential because in the UK they look after the naught to five year olds, so it's a really useful place to have um, good education. So just a couple of examples to show you. So to get eczema conversations going, I have a, a GP colleague, Rosie, Rosie Wellesley, who wrote a fantastic book called The Itchy Saurus, and we went out into primary schools and nurseries, and she did reading and drawing sessions just to get eczema on the agenda and to share these five simple messages. So we've been out, there, out to a few schools and done that. Um, that's me with a... A presenter from Radio Nottingham, BBC Radio Nottingham, and again, five simple messages. And then with a colleague, Julie Van Onselen, who some of you will know, uh, that was at teaching health visitors. And I have to say, the feedback. Um, that we've had has been fabulous. This, this was another day. We worked in a big shopping centre in Nottingham. My um, esteemed colleagues, again, Julie Van Onselen, who's been working with me a lot, and Sandra Lawton. And we had a stand in a shopping centre in Nottingham. In, in the course of a day, we did 94 eczema consultations for people who probably wouldn't go to their GP. And I think that that's quite telling about the need um, that's out there. So there are all sorts of things going on, and I'm going to keep going with them till the end of August, and then think about evaluation. Well, I've already thought about evaluation. So I'm going to do some interviews and focus groups with stakeholders and some metrics from online activity. But I've got a feeling the interviews and focus groups will probably be um, the more interesting, I think. Um, online activity, although it's been targeted to the postcode area, it hasn't been as strong, and I think that's because people are relatively disengaged. There's some key reading there, and I think that will go out. And obviously, I have to acknowledge the NIHR, the National Institute for Health Research, for funding this work, um, all the participants, my mentors, and my friend Jay Noland Latchford, who's done all the beautiful illustrations for me. Thank you for listening. <laughs>